Hey, what up? This is Corey Taylor, and you are watching Heavy Consequence. I know you have a relationship with Anthrax, but before we get into Anthrax and Among the Living, the graphic novel, I wanted to ask you about your own like early interest in comic books and graphic novel as a kid, as a teenager, and were there any particular titles or, or superheroes or characters that really spoke to you? I mean, I've been a comic book fan since I was a kid, you know. Um, I grew up a Marvel kid, but I loved all of them. Like, I mean, I can remember, right, and this is in the 70s, so it always seemed like every house you went to had like a stack of weird ratty comics just <laughs> mixed in with the magazines on the, you know, it was weird. Like, it was like, I was like, oh, okay, this is rad, you know, so I would... That's how I found DC. That's how I, how I found East C. Um, like all the other like obscure, like independent labels that uh, were out at the time. And it just, you know, I mean, between the artwork and the stories and everything, I, I just became a fan. I just fell in love with them, you know? Um, as I got older, um, I would kind of come in and out of, you know, reading comics and whatnot. Obviously once, you know, I kind of got more into music than anything else, but then I returned to it later um, when I was like my early 20s, I started really collecting again. And that's kind of where I've been ever since, you know, collecting uh, different titles, like obviously following different companies than Marvel and DC, obviously Image, um, you know, the, the Evil Ernie comics. Like I got really into like a lot of, like the darker stuff basically and and then i so, and then i started following more writers than i did titles you know mm -hmm. so i really took it as far as it could go you know and now uh, now I, I i tend to kind of like explore more like the back catalog and try to catch up on like different stories that that i didn't read when they were you know first printed and whatnot so that's where my love for trades came in you know like going and finding finding like the complete story in the graphics you know like you can pick up that one storyline and read it top to bottom you don't have to fish through it and find the individual you know uh monthly issues and you know and that's just you know that's what inspired me to do the house of golden bones book mm -hmm. uh for dark horse um another comic label that i absolutely love um and it's also just you know inspired me to try my hand at like different stories here and there, you know? And that's why this this project, as soon as Scott asked me to do it, I like I was like, it was an automatic yes. Cool, was there, uh, was there ever like a, I know for me, I was a big uh, comic book collector too in the eighties. And then the, like the Frank Miller Dark Knight series came out that four part yeah. series. And I was like, whoa, I didn't realize that comics can get that dark. Was there something that you saw that was like, oh, there could be a real darkness uh, into these comics, to these graphic novels, beyond the kind of the, t the typical superhero story. I mean, definitely Frank Miller's work. You know, whether it was with Batman or with with uh, Daredevil, all of that stuff really kind of led me towards, like, obviously Alan Moore and stuff like that. But it was when I first started reading uh, Garth Ennis's work mm. on Preacher that I realized that I mean, there's just nowhere you can't go. You know, like, and I mean, that's one of the craziest comics I've ever read in my life. It's, to this day, is my favorite. And it's so out of control that you're reading it. And you're like, what the hell am I reading? Like, it, can you get away with this? I mean, it pushed the boundaries of everything. And I, I loved it. And that's, that kind of made me turn around and love DC, especially the Vertigo label, like more and more. Yeah. And... Now moving over to Anthrax, uh, obviously, um, before getting into your relationship with the band, uh, can you talk about Anthrax as an influence and also Among the Living, one of the great thrash metal albums of all time, that album in particular as an influence on you as well? Yeah, oh, absolutely, 100%. I mean, Anthrax was, Anthrax was one of my favorite bands since I was a kid. And it, it wasn't just because they could play fast, they could play heavy, they could go balls to the wall. It's they also saw 
the humor in things, you know, and I, I don't know if that's because it was, you know, they were telling more stories than they were trying to go from like uh, a singular emotional standpoint, or if it was just because it was just their personality coming out. But I mean, you have the juxtaposition between Among the Living and the I'm the Man EP, you know, which is both parts funny and cool as hell, you know? They were just, you know, in so many different ways, they were just one of the coolest bands out there, you know? And I was just immediately a fan, you know? I, uh, I went back and I, I, you know, listened to the, to the first couple albums and then I stuck with them through Euphoria and, you know, and even into uh, the, the Bush era, you know? Like to this day, I, you know, I'm just a huge fan. So when I was growing up, you know, they were the first band to really look at fusion with different music, man. Like not just classical. I mean, they came from the street and for a kid who was like poor living in a, a trailer park, you know, like really hand to mouth, you know, sometimes homeless, like that really spoke to me and, and just showed me that you could do anything musically too, you know? So I've just been a massive fan. And obviously on a, a more direct level, there was talk years back of you actually joining Anthrax as a singer when they were in between oh, I vocalists. I know it didn't materialize, but I feel like this uh, graphic novel is almost a little bit of a full circle moment when you think about it like that. Can you talk, take us back to that time and then uh, just you know your relationship with the band itself now? Yeah, I was... Uh... Yeah, you know, I've been friends with those guys for years, you know, um, I met them on my birthday in 1999. We were playing a show with them with Slipknot in Boston. They, and we all just hung out after the show. And for a bunch of dicks from Iowa to be able to hang out with Anthrax was the coolest thing on the planet, man. And they were so great and rad. And we all just got wasted and they were feeding me tortilla chips it was kind of a blur to be honest and and at and you know after that we just we just stuck together we just continued to be friends and whatnot and i was doing a gig an acoustic gig with scott and frankie um fellow and uh in new york and we were doing this cool thing where we just got together and we just jammed out a couple of covers and stuff and we went to dinner and somebody said you know they were in between singers you know so it was right before that but they were like you know who do we get you know you know who who can we get to do this what can we do and they said well why don't you do it and we all laughed and then we all kind of stopped and we were like <laughs> you know i mean why can't i do it now i am obviously closer to john bush's style than i am joey's style i mean he's joey's just so and his range is incredible you know especially now like we're hearing it on the the newer stuff but i was bound and determined to try and find the middle ground and and be able to combine those two worlds you know so for a hot second man it was it was real i mean getting to the point where you know i was talking to charlie about set lists we were putting set lists together um they were sending me demos i was writing lyrics uh, a lot of which ended up on worship music um, but my lyrics ended up, I kind of, uh, ended up reworking some of that stuff and putting it on, uh, all hope is gone. And which a lot of people don't realize, but I, uh, that was sadly shut down by Roadrunner. They basically told me with, uh, with no, no qualms that I can't, I couldn't do it. They, they were, they were adamant that I owed them another album with Slipknot. I said, you know, I, I tried to make it, I was like, I can do both. I can do this. Like just, you know, they were like, you can go and do it, but we're never going to let it see the light of day. Wow. And it was the, that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do was tell those guys that I couldn't do it, man. I, it's, it sucks. And to this day, it's like one of those what if moments, you know, however, <laughs> because I'm a massive fan, I realized that this was, the starting point for them getting Joey back, man. And these last two albums have been fantastic. I mean, just so good. They're a band that they don't get enough credit for their resilience. They don't get enough credit for their creativity 
And they don't get enough credit for the fact that they're willing to try different things in the face of fads, in the face of taste, in the face of, you know, what's hot at the moment, man. They stick to their guns and, and they do it their way. And that's, that's one of the reasons why it's, it's still rad to not only be a fan, but to also be friends with them, you know? Yeah. I mean, as cool as it would have been to see Corey with Anthrax, but seeing uh, uh, Joey back with them for those big four concerts with Metallica and Slayer and Megadeth, like there was something right about that of him yeah. fronting the band for those shows. And, now and he's such a great dude, man. You know, like he's just really, he just loves what he does. He goes up there, he does his thing, man. And afterwards, he just hangs out, you know, like he's like every time, like every time we play with him, like I always look over and he's just side of stage, just, you know, watching and just what bigger thrill than, you know, one of your favorite singers from one of your favorite bands, just having a great time watching you do it, you know? And it's just, I mean, what, what, there's, you can't put a price on that, dude. Yeah. And getting to the graphic novel itself, Anthrax Among the Living, each chapter is is penned by a different author. Uh, you are one of them, Rob Zombie, Brian Posehn, a really cool list. Uh, but and, and and members of Anthrax themselves. Right. Um, you wrote a very sinister chapter, uh, a skeleton in the closet. Yeah. Um, what was it like? Because you each chapter was inspired by a song on the album. So can you right. tell take me into the process of being inspired by the song developing, you know, the, you know, developing the little storyline, the character. Uh, can you take me to that process? Well, it's interesting because that song is actually inspired by a different Stephen King uh, uh, story. I, th I think it's Apt Pupil, um, mm -hmm. where it deals with a, 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 an old Nazi hiding in plain sight who's, you know, hiding these secrets and he ends up passing them on to a younger generation in a weird way. And I was like, I was like, I could have gone down that route, but I didn't want to be as blatant as that, you know? And, and it, I, the thing I loved that I loved about that song and I loved about that title ever since I was a kid was the fact that it resonated with me on a level where everyone has skeletons in their closet, whether they are tiny little, like non threatening, non weird, you know, everybody's got their quirks or real evil deadly skeletons in their closet and I, once i started kind of thinking about that i took it into this weird supernatural vibe of you know this is going in a massive book let's take this book in a weird way and like almost like a book of shadows kind of vibe and this man this dude is attached to it and he has to feed the closet to keep, you know, to, to keep them from eating him and whatnot. And, it, and I liked that, that kind of turn because you could play with that creatively. And I mean, the art, the artwork is incredible. Like the, the, the artist I worked with was, was so good and he was able to really make it something so dark and sinister that just getting the pages back, I was just like, oh, this is even better than I thought it was going to be, man. This is dope. Cool, and um, you mentioned House of Golden Bones, the comic book you did for Stone Sour, and you would think like if any band was right for a graphic novel, it would be Slipknot. Um, has there been talk among the Slipknot camp and is there any ideas for, like, can you envision what that would look like uh, if that ever did materialize? I mean, we've had, we've had a handful of people offer us to do comics over the, over the years, you know, and it's been, it's been, interesting it's like we at one point we were trying to do a we were trying to do a collab to find something that we could put out um comic wise whether it was with dark horse or a, like one of the other um comic uh comic labels but we just nothing has resonated yet you know um i know i've got an idea for something um but I, but I haven't been able to really sit down and extrapolate it. And when I did the, the House of Golden Bones one, dude, I realized how exhausting it is to write a comic. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to go back to doing that again, like anytime soon. I mean, even just doing the short story for, for this was, 
was trying to thread a needle and, and fit it in with a, an already crazy schedule for me. But I mean, I'm glad I did it. So if it was, if we were going to do something with Slipknot, it would have to be so, something where I could sit down and really devote that amount of time to it and, and make sure that it was like, right. You know? 